Well, thank you all. I think we're going to try to do our best to switch it up. Everyone has done their best with uh, the amount of PowerPoint that we've ingested over the last day and a half. So we will do our best to try not to have a serious amount of PowerPoint for the next uh, 50, 60 minutes. Um, so let's get back to the basics. What do we like best about this conference and this community? It's talking about the technology, right? Like understanding what's going on, what issues each other are facing, how we're attacking the problems, bouncing some ideas off of each other. This is some of the things that we thought might be a good idea, you know, from stories from the trenches, understanding how and what the clients are doing. So we decided to make this a little fireside chat. Now, I, um, I said we should get a fire if we're gonna have a fireside chat. And the panel, true to form, is awesome. It was like, Daryl, I'm going to Home Depot. I'm like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. So at least Mike and Charles reeled us back in and said, why don't we just put up a Yule log? It's a little bit safer for, you know, everything in general. So that's kind of how we're going to formulate this. Um, anyway, my name is Colleen Semanek, and I work in a very large Wi-Fi network. But I want to take our, give our panels a chance to kind of introduce themselves, give a little background about their networks, and that'll start to frame some of our discussion. So. Without further ado. So, Daryl DeRosia, work with uh, Xfinity Wi-Fi. We've got millions and millions of access points uh, across multiple verticals. Uh, residential, outdoor, MDU, uh, and even, you know, stadiums and, and venues that we support, so. Uh, Mike Albano, um, I've had experience in higher ed, some service provider, and right now I'm working for Google. Um, doing enterprise, and we've got billions and billions of access points. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I stopped counting. Uh, my name is Charles Rumford. I'm a network engineer for the University of Pennsylvania, um, primarily a Ruby shop with uh, not quite millions, but we're at least in the thousands at 40, uh, roughly 4,400 uh, APs. So. Also, keep the mic. So, you know, before we actually get started, since we're trying to focus this on clients, let's just kind of get a show of hands, make everyone do a little stretch here. So, primary uh, device, client device, where that you're using is Apple. Raise your hand. Show of hands. Okay. How about uh, Android devices? Anybody use Android as their primary? It's pretty even split, actually. Interesting. All right. So earlier today, um, Daryl kind of walked us through in his ten talk the the pop-up network that he set up for the Pope. And um, I know Charles definitely has some experience with some temp networks for large crowds as well. So maybe you can start to walk us through a little bit about what you set up and kind of what your experience was with that with respect to clients and how you kind of got data in that. You want to start there? Sure. Um, so the university, we have a lot of events that come up that are like people being like two weeks out being like, oh, we need, we're putting this giant tent up and we need to put wireless in it or something along those lines. Um, but a couple of years ago, the office of the president came to our office and said, we, the, uh, Joe Biden's giving the commencement speech, and everyone's got to be in the uh, stadium an hour and a half beforehand, and LTE is typically not so great, so we'd like to put some wireless in to help uh, alleviate that stress on the LTE network. Um, and so, Colleen? Yep. So to give us everyone a rough idea. Yeah, I did not lie. It's not all not PowerPoint. Sorry. <laughs> a little bit. Mm -hmm. This one. So to give everyone a, a little bit of a frame of reference. So this is the football field uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. There are 5,000 seats uh, in the center of that. Um, and we surrounded it with uh, 12 Aruba uh, 134s um, with patch panel antennas um, pointing inward. And we basically said, OK, well, we've set it up. And it's turned on. And enjoy. Um, but we did do some, some initial testing um, to make sure that we got coverage around the edges. Um, we were, because it's really hard to test when um, there's no one sitting in the seats, I mean, it's all just free loss, uh, it's really hard to determine how it's actually going to behave. And then it's kind of hard to test it while there are 5,000 students sitting there. Um, so we did a lot of just walking around, making sure we can connect to each AP. Um, and then during the event, I sat um, in the back of the field, um, logged into all the controllers, making sure that traffic was being passed. We think we peaked out at 12,000 users. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty successful event. 
So did, did any of your management or anybody ask you for, so similar to what Daryl put up earlier today where he talked about, um, you know, how do you basically justify, you know, the, your device per user or, or how you're going to kind of, did you come up with some math basically ahead of time to, to find your ratios or did you, you know, I mean, how did you justify what you were doing and I don't know if budget walked into anything or not for this. Right, so we kind of went with the maximum number of clients per AP, um, but the, the more interesting thing is, is that we had an aesthetic problem to deal with also. Like we couldn't just line the perimeter of the seats with APs. Um, so that was our first limiting factor is like we can only put so many APs out. Yep. Um, and then from there we kind of went with like the max quantity of clients that an AP could count, could carry. Um, we actually knocked down the soft limit on the APs so that they wouldn't get super overloaded. Um, so I think the max of them was like 125. We brought it down to like 90 just to kind of ease up on them a little bit. Um, so that was pretty much how we went about it. Nice. So, you know, that brings up a good point about field testing. So here you are trying to field test the unknown. Right, and trying to understand what is it going to be. I mean, you have a good idea. It's not, you know, you don't, you have a good idea of the quantity of people that will be filling those seats, right? But at the same point, you still don't have readouts on attenuation and how that's going to play into effect. So it's interesting. So I know, Daryl, you've been working a lot with uh, some field testing as well. So I was wondering if you could share some of your war stories as well with things that you've been busy with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um don't assume that the client device and the access point see the same things at all, um, especially when power levels are vastly different between an iPhone and uh, your access point potentially. Um, I've seen noise floors that are vastly different where the APs in the you know neg 80 range is what it's reporting for noise, where the iPhone itself is reporting, uh, or I'm sorry, the MacBook is reporting you know neg 90 in the same. Um, general area, you know, just due to buildings and things. So uh, things like noise are relative to the receiver, and you need to understand what the receiver is seeing in its given spot. Um, I think I've got yep. an example here. Uh, we did some testing on a street where we actually walked down the street. Uh, keep going. No. Street view. Yeah, so go back one. We took this particular street, and um, you see test location one, two, and three, and we actually have the AP marked up there. And we did testing at each location, and we reported the results. Um, test location one, things worked well. And... No. This guy. Yeah, that yep. one. Sorry. So the AP is... Uh, Fortunately, I can't see the, the screens here. But the, the client's being seen at NEG 64, and the noise floor is 79. The MCS rate that it's able to achieve is MCS 7, getting down to the client. The client, in this case being an iPhone coming back, uh, was also able to get MCS 7. But the, uh, what it was seeing was NEG 50, so 15 dB delta in the power level at that location. As you move further away, things start to get a little bit worse. As you'll see here, this location, um, we still weren't dropping traffic at this point, but we were seeing uh, NEG 79 on the access point. The iPhone, again, great SNR, but the iPhone's only able to get 5.5 five up. And uh, we started missing some beacons here and having some retransmissions. But uh, downstream, again, the connection was great. At this location, things went to hell and nothing worked. The access point and the client are still showing an association, but you'll see you got a negative SNR. And the <laughs> access <SNR>. point <laughs> is sure. still maintaining an association with a negative SNR because it's an average number. You know, you've got bursts of energy in there creating noise. Um, but again, the client is able to see the access point just fine. If you look here, if I remember right, it's neg 70 that it's seeing the access point at. So, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that certainly presents some challenges. So, so and, you know, and, and you, does you everybody know how to get this type of data off of an iPhone? Who here has a developer account? We got one. So there's actually a debug uh, Wi-Fi profile that you can get as part of the developer account. 
to actually get more information on what the radio is seeing at a phi level. I highly recommend that you, uh, you download it. Awesome. That's great information. When you're trying to diagnose and troubleshoot clients, that field testing information really is helpful. You know, people have been complaining about that in the past, you know. So it's interesting that, you know, everyone on this panel and everyone in the room seems to approach problems in a different fashion. You know, Mike, I, I love how you basically had a, a similar client mix and you've attacked some of the issues in a completely different fashion. So if we can kind of reboot and talk about how some of your field testing experience has been going and some of the approaches that you've been taking uh, for some problems on your network or some data points on your network, that would probably be a, a good start, I think. Sure, so... Um, oh. Yeah, fire away. Can you come up here so we can get the mic? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nobody on the video will be able to hear any of this, and I think they want to. I was trying real hard to memorize. I'm like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> So the other better. thing I was going to say is that while there is sort of a, a lack of tools on the iOS platform to collect information about the environment, the network, what the device is seeing, there is an airport utility that's available in the App Store. And if you tweak one of the settings, you can reveal a scan button that at least will allow you to scan the environment, the air around you. It's not incredibly real time, but it's better than nothing. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the Thank you. Thanks for the tip. So, so yep. going back to, they were basically switching gears to um, client capabilities and you know how that affects your design, right? So, yep. um, the the obvious one is like uh, DFS channels, right? And yep. And at some point, we'll probably come back to the whole list that's been created. But um, you know, how, how do you how do you deal with the, with the unknown? Like, do they support DFS channels? Do they not? Um, one approach is to you know make channel groups, right? So most AP vendors will allow you to do this. You just you you group the the channels so that you know your DCA algorithm is not going to select a stripe of DFS channels in a row. So even if you do have clients that don't support DFS channels, and by the way, this is a very much a, at this point a legacy problem. Most most clients are supporting DFS channels, but you know by this point. But even if you do have to support them, that doesn't mean you can't use DFS channels, right? So one approach that I've taken before is to just make sure that they don't get striped all in a row, right? So you don't have DFS holes. Um, that's just one sort yeah. of example. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment specifically on that. I've got something on that. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, with, there's been a lot of discussion about static versus RM channel plans, right? But when you're striping, you know, it makes sense to have your DFS channel sandwiched between, you know, Uni 1 and, and Uni 3 uh, channel. So, you know, start with, you know, 100, go to 36, go to, you know, 120, and go to 149, and, you know, et cetera. It helps that way if there is a coverage hole or a client that doesn't support it, you can at least hide the the symptom. Yeah, it's just it's just not a, it's not an all or nothing thing, right? The whole RM argument. It's it's not you know all RM or you know or no RM. It's you can modify it with groups to to sort of suit your needs. Um, and then there's <clears throat> so at some point I don't know maybe now we can get into the capabilities thing. Um, yeah. So there's more than just okay. So it's just not just DFS channels. There's you know H11 V R K W whatever you want to enable but you're scared to for whatever reason. Um, so another approach I've taken is to, um, so obviously there's the list, the client's list. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but that's sort of my way of <clears throat> creating a running list of what clients are supporting by looking at the association request frames. Um, there's a, a wealth of information in there, right? So you can, so you can sort of pull out all these fields from the association request and see what your clients support. Um, so something that I've had in a couple environments I've worked in is the ability to just sort of passively sniff uh, you know, over the air and listen for association request frames. And it's pretty easy to do this. I mean, if you have like a bunch, you know, Linux boxes connected to routers or switches, if you're using them for other monitoring purposes or, you know, whatever, it doesn't have to be that. You can, you know, you can use remote uh, packet capture APs, you know, set the APs and in packet capture mode. However you want to collect the data is fine. The, <clears throat> the point is 
you can, you can set capture filters to only apply to association requests and just let those run for weeks on end, right? And you're going to miss, you know, you're going to get a ton of corrupt frames. You're going to miss most of the stuff because it depends on where the device is and all that. But even if the device is sitting in an IDF room on top of a router, you're still going to see a lot. You're still, you're still going to see a lot of association requests over a long period of time. And you don't have to worry about filling up disks. These are, these are small frames. And after a couple weeks or a month, you can then just merge all those, those PCAPs and just do some analysis, right? So I've got a slide, I think, yeah. on um, just an example. And, and this is nothing fancy, right? There's no scripting going on here. This is just simple one-liners. Um, oh, I think I went down. I also think it's like a, just the best slide ever. Uh, no. Is it that one? So, I'm sorry, you're right. You, so you can't yeah, see this. Yeah, that's the one. Yep. Okay, so <laughs> I put this up because I think it's just sort of like a, a silly slide and it's just awesome how many characters I could fit onto one slide. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> right, I mean, this is just like one example, right? So it's just, it's just one, one line. It's like a capture filter, sort the, the clients by and, and unique them. And then, and then just word count them, right? Divide the total frames by the amount that support this, this feature, right? So in this example, I'm just supplying a, uh, uh, the first thing I do is supply a, a capture filter for probes. And then the next thing I'm doing is running it through T-Shark with a display filter for, well, first I pull out any frame that's not, doesn't pass FCS. And then I'm printing out, um, I'm basically applying a display filter for, uh, 802.11v BSS transition supported, right? So that's just one example. You can do this for pretty much anything that's in the association request. Um, and I, I think I have a link on one of the slides. I don't know if it's this one, but basically I just created a doc with all the different fields in association requests and what they mean, right? V, W, um, channels supported, all that stuff. Um, so. I guess my, the, my overall point is that you don't need fancy tools. If you have them, great, but there's, there's cheap, free, easier ways, easy ways to, to do this sort of thing. So I let this run for a month and, you know, in, in a bunch of different places on my campus, and now I can sort of build a percentage of, all right, well, I saw a couple hundred thousand association requests, and out of, out of that many, here's how many support this channel, or here's how many support this feature, right? So that's sort of... An uh, uh, easy thing anybody can do to gauge, you know, be before enabling a feature, gauge, you know, the success of that feature, or maybe squash the fears that, you know, it's going to break everything. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. So, you know, that I love how your approach is for this. You know, you, you basically talked about this and you're gathering data and then you're using that data to systemically, you know, enable features and understand, you know, how will this help or, you know, hurt or, you know, help clients in your network and not hopefully hurt the clients in the network. So I was wondering if, uh, you know, Daryl or Charles, do you do any similar data captures where, I mean, you know, we talked about field testing, like how do you use that data? How do you harvest it? Do you make models? Do you use it for QA test cases? Do you look at stuff in systemic fashion? Like, I mean, how, how does actually this, this data play into your role for, you know, rollout support, configuration, troubleshooting, triage, that type of stuff? So, you know, from my perspective, we've got a massive BYOD network. We don't know what's coming uh, most of the time. So, you know, we kind of know our, our main devices that are going to hit the network and what they support. Um, we try to go with the, you know, minimum feature set. It's open authentication, and unfortunately, it's still a captive portal until uh, Hotspot 2.0 is readily available on all the devices. So uh, trying to get away from that, and, or trying to go to Hotspot 2.0 and, and away from captive portal altogether. Um, you know, but field testing, we actually do a lot of validation and, you know, it's a pain in the butt to time sync logs between the client and the AP to see what's going on uh, when you're out in the field. But, you know, we've seen a lot of interesting things, as I was talking about earlier, where the client may not at all see what the access point is perceiving. And, um, you know, it, it, it thinks it's good, you know, and it would make that decision every time. So, um, that's kind of, you know, what I've seen. And then, you know, taking that data and then, you know, you've got to take that back into configurations, right? So we're actually making manipulations to the beacon power so that our frames, our data frames, will go at full, you know, full rate, uh, full 
SNR, but the beacon management frames don't go as far uh, as a result of reduced power. So we're able to get a little bit more airtime as a result out of that on some of our outdoor stuff. Um, at the university, we have a, a fairly comprehensive list of devices that we quote unquote support. Um, that includes also uh, OS versions um, for iPhone, Mac OS, Windows, um, and Android. And anytime we go to do some kind of major config change, um, we actually have a standards lab that has all those devices in them. And we go through all of them and test them. Um, and anything that's outside of that, we are like, it's best effort. Um, there are a couple of devices that we, we handle um, that we'll give them a heads up that we're about to do something big. Um, but for the most part, if it doesn't fit into that supported, that quote unquote supported list, we just don't really care. Nice. Interesting. Well, so, I mean, that brings up a good point. One of the things that I was thinking about asking is just, you know, do you ever have clients where, you know, you've tested or you've worked with them and then you're just like, no way is that going to work on my network or plug in or anything like that? I mean, like, are there any times when you just flat out say, no, we're not supporting these clients. It will ruin the integrity of the network. And I'm thinking of one in my head that Charles probably has, <laughs> um, that has probably said no to. But I'm kind of just curious because you know the reason why we kind of set up this panel the way it is is because, look, we have a service provider. We got some enterprise. We have some higher ed. You know, and all those different verticals kind of looking at client issues you know, kind of, it's interesting to see how everyone approaches it, but it's also interesting to see, like, can you say no, and does that actually work, or are you still going to have to basically try to figure out a way to support this in the long run? <clears throat> so the one device that we have said absolutely no to are Nintendo Wiis. Yep. Um, <laughs> we, we, across campus, have eliminated all of the B rates and all of the low association rates. Um, and if anyone doesn't know, Nintendo Wii, and I think the first or second generation of the Wii U's won't associate above one or two meg. Um, and so they just don't even see the network. Um, and we got a little bit of pushback from the residential community when we first did that. Um, and then I sat them down and explained the whole thing. And I said, I am not sacrificing the performance of 7,000 people so that five or six Wii's can get on the network. Um, and that's kind of the, the game that we play is like, how far do we want to go to support these like 10 devices that could potentially um, affect the entire network as a whole? Um, we also have the same, play the same game with like AirPlay and MDNS stuff is like, how far do you go down that line? So are you currently supporting MDNS and AirPlay in campus? Not as a campus as a whole. Um, there's a couple of locations that they've kind of like twisted our arm pretty heavily yep. that we have, <laughs> we have enabled it for that specific area, um, mainly in the notion that we just don't suppress broadcast traffic. Um, but we give them this huge red warning label at the beginning that says, if you guys complain about performance issues in your building, the first thing that goes away is the broadcast multicast uh, ability. Um, and then we'll go from there. But we, we, tell, we tell them up front, like, this could potentially destroy the network. So just give you a heads up. And so has it happened? Have you had any feedback? Um, we have not had any feedback because all the people that we've enabled it for haven't actually used what we've enabled for them. Really? It's oh, <laughs> disappointing. <laughs> but hey, they're paying for the switch, so I don't really care. <laughs> Interesting. So, you know, we started talking also about, you know, some of these issues and when we had some conversations before about, you know, hey, kind of what do we what do we want to talk about, what we want to focus on? And, you know, between our conversations beforehand it was, you know, oh well, let's watch out on this, let's not go down the rabbit hole hole, but yet you kind of have to do that sometimes, right? When you're trying to understand these clients, what they're doing on the network and, and how they're performing and, you know, can you support them in a, in, you know, in a reliable fashion? So from, from your experience, I'm kind of curious as to, you know, have you either had good experience where, yeah, you went down the rabbit hole and you realized that from now on I'm stopping at this point, or, you know, I, I still kind of go down there from time to time because it is a good deep dive learn, and that's just kind of what I have to do for my own sake and sanity to be able to 
um, come back clean or, you know, I mean, like, or have you stopped other fellow engineers on your teams doing that type of stuff, right? I mean, you know, everybody sees sometimes you're just like, that's a no-win situation, you know, but um, kind of curious if you could talk either high level or give some examples, whatever, whatever kind of suits you about, you know, how, how your experience with the rabbit hole and client experience has, has helped or hurt things in the past. <clears throat> For me, it's a classic 80-20 problem where like, you spend 20% uh, of your time dealing with 80% of your clients and you spend 80% of your time dealing with 20% of your clients. <laughs> um, and it's a, real, it's a real fine line for some of the stuff. Um, we actually have a pretty, I actually do have a pretty good example. Um, recently, our School of Medicine decided that they wanted to protect their millions and millions of dollars of uh, deep frozen research. And the way they were going to do this was to put temperature monitors on all the neg-80 deep freezes. Um, and the business administrator for the School of Medicine went out and bought 1,200 of these uh, Aegis temperature sensors and then came to us and said, OK, so they're wireless, so let's get them on. Like, why can't you get them on? <laughs> it should be like, that easy. And I'm like, it sh it's like, it should be easy. I'm like, and it's not. Um, they didn't go through their tech support. We, we actually called their tech support and we're like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we have no idea what this is about. Um, but we, we decided to start pushing the standard for EPTLS for these kinds of devices. Um, and they're listed as supported for EPTLS. And so we got one of them in our hands and we started playing with it. And it didn't support EPTLS. And so we got the vendor in and we spent a day packet capturing and radius servering to figure out what was going on. They went back to their developers and then we came back and we did this back and forth. And if I got to the point where I was like, guys, we're spending way too much time on this. Exactly. Right? Like my chief, my, my senior radius guy is spending all of his time doing this one device when I need him like working on like authorization stuff for the rest of campus. Right, like we're we're wasting too much time, and we just cut it off. Um, but that it, it's for me, it's an, also an interesting question of do I have the time, or is this intellectually interesting? Because sometimes the rabbit hole is intellectually interesting, but not worth the time. Yep. So that's another another one to go after. So do you have the restraint to ever say I'm curious and? But I don't have the time to do it, and do you stop yourself or not? Or nope, your... I do it at home. Yeah, exactly. Off <laughs> yeah. hours. Of course. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on their experience or. Um, no, I, I. I mean, I could echo what he said, and I mean, in the, in the enterprise, you have a little bit more control. I mean, there's yep. still a need to do lab networks and stuff for people that want to experiment and things like this. But um, from from a higher ed, from my higher ed days, it was pretty much whatever. Yeah, Somebody so bought that day. It was it needed to be supported, and you would have to sort of not. You had less of a less of a choice in it. Um, and I just the the personality type that if I don't understand something, and it, even if it's broken, and I shouldn't be spending time on it, um, that can sometimes be fun. Right. So Absolutely. yes, I don't I don't have as as good a restraint as you put it uh, <laughs> as, as as I should. Maybe. I got it. I understand. I don't know. I'm looking at higher level information typically, you know, trying to get trends on things and, you know, what's coming into the help desk or the call center and what does the physical layer look like across the estate and, you know, finding some interesting stuff there. Um, you know, like channel contention, I think we've talked a lot about that recently and actually did some mapping of that, uh, you know, by zip code and it's interesting and, you know, it stands to reason, but as soon as you get to the urban center, right, it, the channel contention goes to hell and you can't do anything, at least on 2-4. Um, but actually being able to map that out is, is pretty interesting, and then you can do something with that to actually, you know, tell the help desk, hey, get them, get them something that's either 5 gig capable or figure out if you can turn off 2-4 or change the SSID to at least help them out, stop the bleeding. Nice. All right. So, you know, one of the things that we all deal with as well is that, you know, you have some issues on the client side, but ultimately you might need to uh, bend some of your infrastructure equipment to be able to support what some of the clients are sending and how they're sending it. So kind of curious, but like all three of you seem to be very good at grabbing the correct data in, in whatever fashion you grab it, whether it's through logs, TCP dump, you know, I mean like packet captures, things along those lines. So what kind of information have you always found, like you always just go straight to the PCAP all the time for success and that's 
that's kind of what you arm yourself with when you start opening tickets with vendors and start uh, triaging what's going on in the field. Is that, is that the strategy or do you have kind of something else you... Um, my strategy is sort of to just give them, you know, as much information as I can, it, it, like give them the ticket that I would want to receive. Um, yeah. And that works at least 50% of the time. Nice. I mean, I, I try to arm myself with data from the, I try to put as little effort into it to get the most amount of data uh, up front. So I can try to get as much information out of the controller as I can, uh, get as much information out of the device as I can, um, and then really not move to packet captures until the vendor like specifically asks for like the packet capture between the radio server and the controller. Okay, fine. I can. Okay. Right. If I can, if I can do as little effort up front. Awesome. <laughs> nice. I always try to see if the problem's repeatable. If it's repeatable 100% of the time, you know, then I start troubleshooting on the OSI, getting captures, getting logs, um, getting as much information as I can about the environment, and take the environment out of it. I'll actually put the device in a chamber and see if I can replicate it there. Uh, not everybody here probably has the luxury of having chambers, but they're very nice to isolate everything when you can get all the noise and exterior uh, everything out of it, and it's just the client and the AP. So, you know, thinking about the clients, you know, we're, we're talking about just in general their support, but are there any applications or kind of killer apps out there, time-sensitive apps, voice, and that you guys are trying to support that's starting to present a challenge, whether it's across all OSs or certain uh, form factors or something like that along the way? Is there any experience or things that are kind of a, a presenting a challenge right now to you or things that you're thinking about? You know, Mike, you started bringing up the point, you know, hey, I can see if my network is, is ready to support some of these features. You know, I mean, like, is that, are you trying to grab some of that data as well to say, hey, you know, maybe I can support voice with, with the type of data that I, I see with the clients that are out there and, and, and that type of stuff. So kind of curious, like, from the application side on the client, like, you know, what, what kind of work are you doing with it? Um, so we, we currently don't have any killer apps right now that are like crippling our network or causing a lot of problems, but um, I do spend a lot of time thinking about things that we're gonna have to tackle like two years from now, three years from now, and try to put us in a position now to handle that so that we don't have to handle it two years from now. So when the VoIP guys come to us and say, okay, we're now moving to you know, soft clients on iPhones, and I'm like, and the problem being, right, like we were, we've already tackled this. Um, I think the biggest thing that we're about to face is um, doing Xfinity's on-campus IPTV. Okay. Um, and we're super curious, so we've become super curious about the quantity of Netflix, HBO, Hulu, like lot, streaming, streaming content mm -hmm. uh, that's coming across our network at this point, and then what that's going to look like when we actually bring up the uh, Comcast Xfinity on campus. So do you have a good breakdown or an idea right now um, by protocol uh, of what the usage is on your network in, in different areas or fashion, or not so much? Not so much. Um, we have some super high level stuff from the controllers regarding the, the app RF stuff, um, but nothing super deep level. Um, we have to turn on that feature. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, I mean, I think voice over Wi-Fi is sort of becoming a thing, and um, it's probably already on most of our networks, whether we know about it or not. So that, that, that I think, is something that has my interest in it, um, as far as, like, you know, the fast BSS transition and stuff like that. Like, why am I so interested in coming up with whether or not it breaks things and how to respond to that is because I think it is going to become a, a necessity, whereas for the most part, up until this point, there's many many wireless networks where it's like, well, why do I even care? Why even turn on 802.11R? You, know, you really don't need it, so, so don't bother. Um, but I think that is probably going to change. Nice. Uh, again, our environment's different. Um, you know, the apps are whatever we are, are providing, and we're providing a voice app, we're providing a, a video app, and the expectation is that wherever you're using those, especially on our network, that they're gonna work, so. Um, you know, we've got systems in place in the 
where we aggregate all our, our data to actually, you know, uh, tap the the uplink and actually get protocol analysis and timing just to make sure that, you know, packets are getting there, there's no latency and things like that in there. Um, but it's not, you know, one specific app that, that, you know, that we're focusing on. So, you know, jumping from layer seven down to layer three, I'm actually just kind of curious as far, I alluded, it, alluded to it earlier today where I mentioned, so I mentioned uh, today that I, I firmly believe that if you're going to have a good, stable Wi-Fi network, your client should have the opportunity to keep its same IP address as it moves throughout the network. So I'm kind of curious if you guys are set up for that or if you have an opinion about that. Um, you know, I realize that a lot of times that introduces a heck of a lot of complexity into the network itself. Um, is that something that you're thinking about or support or just not kind of set up to do that at this point in time? So, uh, absolutely, the client needs to have consistent behavior uh, and a consistent experience. And across the public estate, you know, we try to keep the IP the same um, for the user. Um, when the one thing that, that's interesting, um, the first thing that the client does, though, as it roams from AP to AP is a DHCP request. I don't know if everybody else is seeing that or not, but. 100% of the time, the first thing that iPhone does is say, hey, is my IP still valid as soon as, it, as, soon as it's roamed? Mm -hmm. Which is helpful as well, but you know, yeah, it, if that IP were to change, it would kill sessions in the middle of what they're doing. So, yep. Yeah. So the question is, is the um, uh, DHCP request consistent no matter how it roams. I don't have an answer to that. Um, we don't have, you know, fast roaming implemented. Uh, I'm seeing it, you know, it, but I'm seeing it when it goes uh, from AP to AP 100% of the time right now. So I believe that it probably is. There are probably some people in the room that could answer that that probably won't right now. So, well, I could take a little bit of that. So by, by spec of protocol level, um, the, the example that Daryl mentioned is because the SSID that he's dealing with is open. So there isn't, you don't, you associate, then you authenticate and you, and you grab your DHCP address and you're off to the races, right? So um, if you are looking at something like OKC or 11R, you're talking about an EAP-based uh, authentication, right? So from there, you have to authenticate before you associate and grab an IP address. So you will have to go through those steps first before you can IP at that point in time. So that probably won't be the same behavior going all the way through. Yep. Yep. Uh, so we have like 180 individual buildings on campus. Um, and mobility, IP mobility com become, comes up from time to time. And I typically squash it pretty easily um, because we don't have pervasive outdoor coverage. Okay. Um, so if we had pervasive outdoor coverage where you could walk from building A to building C and not lose signal, uh, then IP mobility would become a problem. Um, and then we would deal with it that, as needed. But right now, if you go from building A to building C, then you drop your Wi-Fi signal anyway. So if you change IP addresses, I really don't care. <laughs> So, um, so it sounds like from uh, just a wild guess here, sounds like that you subnet a lot and you have a lot of different, I mean, so is that a design constraint because you're curious about uh, large broadcast domains and like that's been a problem or something that you've made sure to kind of combat against as far as airtime broadcast? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that suppress that anyway out there from um, enterprise fashion. <clears throat> well, I can speak historically that... <laughs> I'm laughing because that Colleen, was a softball cause, 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 cause here, Colleen yeah. hired me at the university and then left six months later. Um, historically, <laughs> or to give you an idea, uh, Penn's a very heavily layer three environment. Every building has its own set of subnets, has its own router. Um, and in the days of fat APs, those APs dumped their traffic locally. Um, so then when we moved to a controller environment, we just slurped up those VLANs up into the controller and maintained that per building VLAN notion. Um, we've been slowly moving away from that. Um, my ideal environment would be five you know, 
giant v, flat VLANs, but that's not where we're at. Um, but you know, as you get larger, you know, you do have to start worrying about broadcast, multicast, and things of that nature. Um, but you know, with broadcast suppression, it's not really a problem. Nice. Um, so one of the other things that uh, you know we're starting to notice as a client trend is that battery life is getting much better. So do any of you have a concern, or do you think that's going to affect the way the clients are operating on your network today? I mean, just kind of curious if that plays into a, a factor for anything that you're doing or thinking about moving forward. No? All right. I mean, that's, I mean that's fair. The, the only thing that I'm like I mildly aware of is that there's a couple of mobile devices that, in an effort to try to save battery, don't roam very well. Yep. Um, Android being the most notable one that I can think of um, in the past. Um, and those are the bigger ones that we have to, to deal with, is that we get a lot of people who call in and say, oh, we're having, it's really bad experience, and we're standing right under the AP. And then when we look into it, they're actually connected to three APs over. Um, so. Yeah, I think the only thing <coughs> that comes to mind with regard to that point, I think you were mentioning it before, was um, subnet size. So as, yep. as you have more on time, or as the battery life gets better and devices change their sleeping behavior, their consumption of, of address space um, could actually grow. Um, but it, that's the only thing I have. I mean, I think the sleeping behavior is, is important. Um, I've seen, you know, where access points didn't enable that, and they just pester the crap out of the client, taking up airtime. Um, iPhone, for example, said to the AP, hey, I'm, I'm going to take a nap now. And the AP kept sending it, you know, requests to block time to send traffic to other clients. Even though the packet captures were very clear, it's like, hey, I'm I'm out for you know the next 20 minutes or whatever it was. So um, I think part of the way they're achieving you know additional battery life is being more aggressive with sleep mode. Yeah. So you know it brings up an interesting point about you know how you don't expect some things, you do expect some behaviors, um, but when if we take the idea of malicious client behavior out of it, but it's one of those things where it's like when good clients behave bad. We've all seen that stuff before, right? So we've seen this notion of, hey, my DHCP lease is 10 minutes, but yet I'm not always asking for uh, a DHCP renew halfway through. Um, you know, do you ever get concerned about that? Is that some things that you decide to change lease lengths in certain deployments, especially high density ones? Um, you know, do you, do you basically run into any problems along the way when you have clients that are supposed to, you know, adhere to a protocol or standard and then they kind of don't and it's unexpected and then, hey, if that's 60% of the share of the clients you have on the network, that has an impact, right? So, you know, I was wondering if you could share some of those good clients behaving badly stories. <laughs> I, I think I'd rather not, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the... Uh, Different clients behave different different ways, and every time uh, any code release is done, whether it's Android or, or Apple that's releasing the client for mobile device, I get a little scared because I don't know what's coming sometimes. Um, having the developer account helps with that quite a bit, but I know in a previous life, um, iCloud was introduced and my upstream traffic went up by about 250%. Uh, we weren't expecting that, um, and we had some problems as a result. It was what the client was meaning to do and, and it was a good thing, you know, having backups and, um, but, you know, in high density, you know, extend the lease, you want to get everything off the air as you can. Mm -hmm. um, in low density environments, you know, short lease times tend to work for transient traffic. Um, so working at a university, you know, our, our engineering school loves to have these big hackathons <laughs> um, and you know, while everyone there has good intentions, there's always at least a stray few clients who write their for loop incorrectly and then are like spamming the network. Um, so we do have a couple of those. I think the more interesting thing is good clients doing good things that turn into bad things. Mm -hmm. um, the most notable one that I can think of is there was an iOS update a couple of years ago that kind of crippled parts of our network because it's like everyone was getting this like one gig file uh, all at once. Ooh. Like everyone just, and so we had some issues with that. Um, but again, it's, it's good clients doing good things that res but in large quantities result in bad stuff. 
it's also an interesting one to think about. Yeah. I mean, I know I've seen, over the years, I've seen clients that all of a sudden have a valid IP lease, and then for some whatever reason, all of a sudden it'll send a packet upstream and the source the source MAC address stays as it should be, and then the source uh, IP address is either a DNS IP or it's the IP of your gateway. And when all of a sudden that ends up in a client table in a controller or something like that, that's not good for your network, right? I mean, it wasn't a malicious thing, you know, I mean, it was, you know, you're grabbing system logs off of there trying to figure out what or how is this happening and why is this happening and putting, you know, ACLs on things to kind of combat some of that stuff. So I guess, you know, that kind of, starts talking about the fact you get burnt by some things that happen. That kind of hurts. And you kind of remember it sometimes, right? So um, do you have kind of a rhyme or reason? Do you add test cases to it? Or how do you make sure that that stuff doesn't happen again? You know, I guess is, is some of your experience. <clears throat> so if it's something that I, if it's a problem that I've been able to like replicate in lab, um, then I try to re-replicate it. Um, there's a bunch of problems that I faced. Yep. So at the time we were doing a lot of flow data or NetFlow, um, so we were able to see destination IPs, and it was actually before Apple deployed their uh, caching network. Um, but we noticed a giant spike in it was like 1 p.m. in the afternoon on the release date, and our um, external connections like spiked by like a gig and a half per second, and then we started poking around the controllers at packet util or channel utilizations and stuff and noticed a pretty significant increase. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, like at the time they didn't have the the app RF and stuff like that wasn't out. So um, Wait, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think it was, you know, you get, you get burnt by some issues that happen. Oh, yeah. And then when you get burnt by these issues, how do you make sure it doesn't happen again? The last thing you want to do is go in front of your user community that you're supporting and say, oh, happened again. We had a DNS failure again. Oh, it happened again. You know, our controller died from something that we knew and we didn't fix it properly. So <clears throat> if it's, again, if it's something that I can replicate in lab when we were doing our original, t like, original debugging, then I try to replicate it again in lab. Um, but I've definitely, over the years, run into a number of issues that it's a quantity of scale issue, where it's like one in every like thousand clients has this problem or something like that. And those are the harder ones to, to replicate and to test. Um, and I've definitely gone to my management and been, they're like, so did you, like, is this actually fixed? And I'm like, well, Aruba claims it's fixed. <laughs> and I've put like, 500 clients on it and haven't seen the issue, so yeah, they're always guess we're ready to go. <laughs> when, you, when you tread into that unknown and you're like, yeah, it, I think so, but right. you know, you wait. So I mean, it's 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 hard to it's hard to to test that stuff and then to also prove to management and like change management boards and stuff like that. Like, okay, this was actually fixed. Um, I've definitely had a, a number of those before. Nice. Did you guys have you guys had any experience with trying to? combat from, uh, you know, clients and things like that, or issues that have happened that you are trying to patch and you don't want it to happen again, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's the standard things like access control lists and things along those lines. Is there anything else that we should be mindful of? I mean, here we are, a community together, and one of these things, and the, and the reason we, we have this panel is to share this information, because the last thing you want to do is for it to happen on any of your networks, too. If it happened for us, like, lesson learned, let's share that knowledge so we're all not sitting there on an on-call, like, uh, basically up all night trying to figure out what the heck is going on here if it's a known issue. I mean, I don't have anything spe specific. I would just say that sort of like one way to approach that is to build your own lab and it does not have to be fancy. Um, yeah. So when you're doing a code upgrade or whatever, it's not, I mean, you know, there's the standard things like do it in one building and then three or where, however you choose to stage your rollouts. But uh, you can go a little bit beyond that, you know, set up, set up a small lab, couple APs, doesn't take much, and and try and set baselines. Um, you know, even if you're just using iperf and whatever, it's it's better than nothing. Um, so I don't have anything specific, but that's just sort of a general thing. Yep. 
you know, if we can build a test case around it, we absolutely do. Um, you know, some things are, are harder to replicate. We had one uh, uh, Android phone that, for whatever reason, won't follow a, a 301 to redirect it to the captive portal. Nothing we can do about that one. The, the phone just isn't following the standard or the protocol in that case. Yep. Um, but, it, you know, if you can replicate it, you always do. And then in deployment, you know, go with a slow approach, you know. To pick one area, target it, monitor it, uh, and then continue the, the rollout. So, you know, that, that also begs the question that a lot of times when we see problems, it's never in the lab, right? I mean, it's great when you could replicate them, but, you know, most of the problems are caught in production because it's hard to replicate that environment. So, you know, do you, do you ever have any fancy scripts or things like that? You know, like you said, you don't have to get fancy, but do you ever run any scripts where you try to pretend that you're 10,000 iPhones or a whole bunch of just users plugging away at the network just trying to send a whole bunch of ARP requests and, and DHCP requests and things like that along the way? Like, do you have any kind of method that you do to do, like, load or saturation testing? I mean, a lot of us out here, like, we are fortunate that we, we have a lot of test equipment, but we have scale to back it up. But, I mean, that test equipment's usually pretty expensive and pretty pricey. And, you know, you don't have to get fancy. I'm just kind of curious if, if anyone basically has any scripts or stuff like that that they run. It's like, you know, not that you have to share those scripts, but, I mean, homemade stuff that, that you've done on the fly that basically has helped you kind of understand what or how your system would perform under load. Um, yeah, I mean, Linux is your friend. I think, actually, I think Jake is next door talking about this very thing, like what can you do with just free tools um, in way of virtualization and creating, you know, virtual clients and um, trying to put load on a network. Um, so, sorry to you guys who chose this room, <laughs> but, <laughs> but maybe watch that video. <laughs> yeah, we'll all get a chance. <clears throat> Um, I actually have a VMware cluster in my lab that has four wireless uh, USB cards in them, and they have a bunch of OSs loaded on them that I can map the, US, the USB wireless card to the VM and then be able to remote into it and run various tests and stuff like that. Um, but I've also done like some iperf stuff. The big thing that we have is we have a pretty strong community who is deeply interested in making sure that the wireless works. Um, and so if there's any new features or anything like that, we can reach out to those guys. Um, but especially when some of the, a lot of the high density stuff was coming out, um, we would be like, okay, we'll buy you guys lunch. Uh, can you guys come to this room? We would you know, do a baseline test. Everyone would be like, hey, I need everyone to turn off their wireless and then everyone turn it on right now. And then, like, do a bunch, run through a bunch of tests with like a bunch of actual devices um, to test stuff like that. So nice, that's awesome. So I, I know we're running light on time. I have no idea if we're close or not. I look, I think we're pretty close. But um, I just wanted to open it up to the audience if anybody wanted to build off of some of the topics or trends that we were chatting about. I know a couple people started uh, jumping in, but you know, if there's anything else that you wanted this panel to answer. Um, you know, I mean, of course, we're around for the rest of the week, but this is a good opportunity to start vetting some of the things. Hey, I've seen this. This is driving me crazy. And, you know, has anybody else seen this? It's kind of nice just to be in the trenches together sometimes when we're all dealing with the same clients that are out there. Yep. I'll repeat it. So, so the question is about how we model data, and um, you know, we we have a, a rather large number of sessions that connect to the network on a monthly basis. Um, it's got a lot of zeros at, at the end of the one, but uh, what we're able to do because of scale, we're able to kind of see trends and, and we're tracking, you know, total usage, right? Uh, so we're able to see when uh, usage increases by 10 or 20 percent. Uh, and, you know, we, we always have overhead uh, over uh, what we expect. Right now we're looking at increasing uh, the backhaul in several locations to accommodate the number of devices that are connecting. So um, it's a constant thing that we're monitoring and, and, and looking at. Um, happy to talk with, talk with you more in detail. 
uh, about how we, we look at it, but I mean, we've got radius data for the session. It tells us how long the session was, how much down, how much up, and you can find out quite a bit by analyzing that, especially at scale. So I'm not the one to answer that, but the question was uh, client devices on a 802.1x that don't trust the certificate um, on BYOD. So this is a this is an interesting one. Um, so there's nothing much one one as the network operator can do about that because like if they don't check the box, then they don't check the cert. Um, I think the thing we, we at, the, at the university try really hard to um, make it as easy to onboard devices as possible. So we use um, CloudPath um, and this ensure that <laughs> we're pushing out valid settings to everyone. Um, and then we do, if you dig deep enough into our website, you can find all the manual configurations for like li various Linux and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I would love it if they would validate the cert, but if they don't, they don't, so. Yeah. Yeah, I've, 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 I've been tempted uh, from time to time to set up a rogue AP and plop it somewhere on the network and basically capture a bunch of usernames and passwords from people who don't do that and then just send them an email being like, you really need to, <laughs> but I feel that that would be kind of unethical to do. <laughs> well, we're, we're getting there, I'm hope. Yeah, so. Right, I mean, that, that, that's, that's an interesting way to, oh, repeat, uh, so if, if, correct me if I got this wrong, um, but basically uh, uh, segmenting off the users who don't load some special profile is the suggestion. Um, how do you know that they didn't check the box or they didn't set it up themselves and how do you do, deal with devices? So, so what, what you're stating is have a, a, a walled garden, probably on an open connection, and forcing a download of a profile, and that profile has all the proper settings in there, and then it will go over to the secure. Mm -hmm. Correct, correct. So Cisco and Aruba have great documentation. Uh, I think both are represented in here on onboarding uh, for that. So. Yep. Well, the certificates and, and or the you know that uh, profile fixes some other things, right? So even if they reset all their network settings, which you will do in troubleshooting, it sticks, and, or it doesn't necessarily stay. It rebuilds it, right? Yeah, so we had another question over here. Is it possible to get a public cert? And yes, is the answer. <clears throat> the, thing that's, the thing that's interesting about that is that like we're using a public cert, like we're using it in common cert, um, and they're trusted across all the browsers and all that, but the OS itself doesn't have the root CA. 
mm -hmm. right? So unless, so the, the, the CA list for the OS itself is much smaller than the, I mean, when you download Firefox, you're basically implying that you trust something like 10,000 CAs or something crazy like that. And the OS, there's like 30, right? <clears throat> yeah, because the justification is, well, I just spent $15,000 on this in common thing that I get you know, unlimited free certs, why am I paying for another cert? Right, like, those are the questions that get asked. What? Right, but then the, but then, but then the root, but then the root CA is not trusted, impl implicitly trusted. Right, but I also have devices that, we're, we're talking about devices that you just click on the network and it just connects. I know. So but it sounds it sounds to me like we should probably t so back in 2012 they actually did make a change from root to intermediary and I think this either delves a good ten talk for someone who's interested if you're looking for a topic because people are certainly interested in it or uh, we could certainly have hallway conversation so we'll just limit it to one more question if it's not about this if it's not about cert so what's it what do we got Chuck. So, so the question is on our network at Comcast uh, Hotspot 2.0, uh, and what's uh, prohibiting that? Uh, we've we've got a couple challenges. Um, one is device support, both from access points and client device, uh, and the other is, is testing and, and resources to do it. Um, you know, we've got a, you know, anytime you're doing anything in scale. Um, you introduce additional challenges, so uh, we've been looking for the right resources, people-wise, to um, help us scale a solution. We've got uh, a secure SSID in on our outdoor plant, and it's being used. Uh, we want to get over to Totspot 2.0. Um, can I can I state what the internal timeline is on that? Um, hopefully, by the by the end of the year for our first beta on that, I think. <laughs> Not committed. Coming soon, I think, is but, what you're uh, coming soon. It's what we're hoping to do. Yep. Um, so at this, I think we need to wrap up. I'd like to thank Charles, Mike, and Daryl for an awesome We've panel. got one more thing. Oh. oh. Mike, Mike, yes, I'm Mike sorry. has something totally to, to ask right. everybody for. Please, sorry. OK, so for those that don't know, there's this clients.mikealbano.com. It's just this list of client support, right? And it's a lot from the community, the people sending me PCAPs of association requests, and then I just put it on the list. Um, it's just, it's basically a simple spreadsheet, but it turns out that's basically uh, what, I, what everybody wants to see. I can turn off the rest of the blog. Uh, but <laughs> what I want is I have a, so I've got a, my laptop right here doing a capture in the exact way I described before, and I have a little AP sitting next to it. So if I could ask, Anybody that would care to share, um, come up and associate to this SSID. It's, it looks a lot like my email address. And then <laughs> just send me an email or a tweet or DM or whatever, smoke signals, write it down. Um, your device type, last four of your Mac, and that's it. So just to give some context, the way that that spreadsheet actually gets populated is I also I created a script to randomize Mac addresses. So you know on, on that client list, if you click on the, the actual device name, it'll download a PCAP with the SSID and the MAC addresses all randomized so everybody can sort of download them, look at them, um, and see for themselves what the device is advertising support for. Um, that's randomizer.mikealbano.com. And th these are just simple scripts. Um, if you actually write code, you know, try not to laugh too hard when you look at it. I'm not a developer. I just had a problem I was trying to solve. Um, but anyway, yeah, the SSID is um, mike at mikealbano.com. It's my email address. Uh, connect to it with your device, last four of your Mac, and the device type. Question. Uh, 
Right. So, so what I'm doing with those association request frames is obviously I'm just I'm pulling out the fields from from the request and the ones that I think are useful that people want to see like uh, spatial stream support, channel support, um, TX power. The ones I think are useful, I'm I'm adding a column in that spreadsheet, right? Um, dot 11w support. The one I found most inaccurate is the transmit power, the advertised min and max transmit power. So it does advertise it as DBM, but I don't know. It, I, I wouldn't really trust it. And sometimes, sometimes if it, it will just advertise like an arbitrarily, like a 256 or something, like clearly they didn't write in what, they, what it actually supports. Yeah, I see clients uh, or APs all the time that report signal strength as RSSI. Some of them report it as SNR, and they call it different things from different manufacturers. And it's the same way in, in the clients, right? Um, you know, they're just taking a field, and the developer may or may not know what what measurement it is in. Yeah, and just sort of a side note: this is a best effort thing. It's it's not 100% accurate. Clients advertise support for things that they don't support sometimes, and sometimes the reverse is true. Uh, channel 144 being a great example. So we still have a lot of clients that, that lack channel 144 support, even though they're AC clients. Um, some of them say they don't support it, but they actually do, and some of them say they do and they don't. Um, that is a corner case. It's less than 5% of the time, um, but it does happen. Yes, definitely. I agree. Great resource, and thank you. If, thank you. And I would love for everybody to share their knowledge as well, too, so we can keep this going and have it more accurate. The bigger the sample size, the better chance this will stay accurate. So thank you. Yep. And many thanks to the, the panel. I much appreciate it, guys. <laughs>